systems and making the sails and the foils work well, well, putting the leeward heel on means that our rudder starts to have an action on the bow um, in an up and down direction. So if you take it to an extreme, tip the boat right over, put the rudder to leeward, the bow lifts up. Okay, so the worst possible scenario is you tip the boat over and you have weather helm because then that would force the bow, the bow down, uh, and, which is the wrong thing to do when you're approaching a wave. So use your rudder vigorously to control when your wave and your bow are going to hit each other. And a, a little bit of scale on my last comments on waves. Um, when, the wave, when I talk about moving aft, I'm almost leaping aft and sometimes moving to um, only, a, only level with the front of my tiller. So I'm moving a good two and a half, three foot aft. So it's quite a big movement aft by my way, and Sally's certainly moving quite a bit as well, level with the, level with the thwart. For, for big waves, that's what's required. And how much leeward heel? Again, I wasn't exaggerating too much. If it's a really big wave set, you need to put a significant amount of, of, of heel on temporarily to get the, uh, the action that you want over the wave. Um, and so I would say, as, as I show it, is a typical amount of, of heel for a, bit, for a big set of waves. Uh, particularly useful tips if you're trying to go over the wake of other boats, you know, and you're, you're hitting big, big sets of waves. Um, I would say um, Sally would be shouting, saying a set of waves are approaching. You know, the, the warning and the synchronisation of what you're doing is really important and that potentially both the helm and the crew are synchronised way going to ease the jib and the main slightly whilst you do the manoeuvre. Okay, so that's extreme waves when you're hitting them. If you're sailing through regular waves all the time, um, you're going to have a more static position on the side of the boat and you're using your fore and aft movement. And uh, a common way of showing how much movement you do in the boat is to sitting on a chair like this, it's this sort of amount of movement. Sorry if I fall over. So you're jerking your body on the side of the boat and you can achieve a lot of the bow lift and the bow down by doing that sort of jerky movement, particularly if the helm and the crew move together. I'm wearing hiking pants um, when I'm doing that, which gives you, does give you more connection with the boat uh, and I also make sure that the, the surface of my boat in wavy conditions is non-slip. So I'm not going to slide around on it rather than connect with it. Um, the other thing I'd say in terms of if it's regular waves is you just need to get into the, the groove and, and actually just get into the pattern of the waves um, and try to sort of relax through them. But even on a day when the waves are relatively regular, there will be flat spots and, um, and intensely higher waves. That's just the way waves work. Uh, and so important things are there to spot the big, tr uh, big crests when they're coming towards you and to particularly look for plat flat patches when you're trying to tack. So we often would delay a tack whilst we're waiting for a good patch of water. Ready? And... Okay, number two, boat setup. First of all, the things that are most relevant to the way we sail the boat. Um, so, if your rig tension adjustment via the jib halyard uh, is going to work properly, you need to make sure that your forestay has got enough length of adjustment on it. Um, I, I mentioned before that I let the jib halyard right off in strong winds such that the boom almost come, does come down onto the transom. So you need to make sure that the forestay is long enough to allow that sort of thing to happen. If you don't do that, tension taken on the forestay means the jib luff will be sagging more than it should do. Uh, it, may, it may break, um, but it'll certainly be slow. Uh, in terms of basic setup, I'm also um, got it such that when I pull the rig tension on, which I do do for reaching, uh, the, the, mo the, the mast shifts forward. Um, the 8mm it's allowed to move at deck level and at that point the shrouds go roughly a bit uh, fairly tight. So if I, if I did that on the shore, um, 
you'd, you'd be able to feel that the shrouds are tight when I pull the rig tension on. Okay, so that's just a, a rough guide as to um, where I'm at. And when I've let the rig tension off for medium winds, my boom is approximately horizontal. And so obviously that's before I apply main sheet tension, which then brings it down below the horizontal. I mentioned before that uh, I have more adjustment on the centre plate than a sort of a standard issue team racing boat, which generally they have the rubber plugs on the top of the centre plate. I've taken those off and I've used a little piece of spectra instead so I can drop the plate into the boat, into the centreboard case and uh, use more range of movement by doing that. Um, sorry, leaping back to the mast, I've got the spreaders pretty much swept right aft. Um, I, I've tried different positions, Sally and I together are quite light and that allows the mast to bend more in a fore and after direction and therefore gives more um, responsiveness when, I do sh when we do sheet hard, the sails go flatter because the mast bent more. Um, and I, I believe that's, that gives us more height and it works better for us. Uh, so again, I, I know that if you're heavier, generally people say they have the, the spreaders so that they're pushed forward, um, but I would suggest some people have overdone that. Other personal kit um, side of things, I mentioned before I use uh, hiking pants, which I'm, I'm happy to advertise. I think they're a great thing. They it make the circulation in your legs keep going when you're hiking hard and make it easier to hike harder for longer. Um, so I do recommend them, certainly for helms. I know that crews sometimes find them not the right thing. I use uh, good old rubber gloves, uh, not, not uh, washing up gloves, but gardening gloves with the rubber coating on um, because that gives me more grip for less energy and it means I can use thinner sheets. Although I have to say I use a generously thick main sheet as well because I need my full 8mm because I am pulling it very hard and I even wrap it round my hand sometimes because I'm putting all my weight into the main sheet to avoid having to use any kicker at all. Um, my setup involves us, me and Sally, um, having enough food and water in the boat and again it's, it seems really obvious but, um, but uh, we do drink plenty on the boat and I see other people again perhaps get dehydrated so I think it's really important not to get dehydrated. Okay number three, going the right way. Okay so for me uh, a lot of um, the decisions on the tactics are determined by uh, my understanding of what the wind is going to do on the race day. So I'm, as soon as getting afloat, I'm interested to start, try and start uh, wind shift tracking. So I have a compass on board. I'm currently using these uh, tactic compasses, which are, uh, and I use it in normal compass setting mode, which means that I have. Um, the ability to see the actual compass heading. I don't use the tactical facility on these compasses at all. I have previously used uh, a good old silver compass as on, seen on most lasers and I, and I found that just as good um, eh, on, a, on a really shifty day but on a sort of not so shifty day the tactic compass gives you that accuracy because you can see a, you know, a one degree, two degree change uh, more easily on a tactic compass. So what I'm actually doing with it, well we go out and we try to get those wind headings as soon as possible. So if we're running down to a start area, we'll turn and take some windward rin, uh, wind readings on the way out to the start line. Get Start to get a feeling for what's a good heading on starboard and a good heading on port. Okay, just in terms of using the compass, there are some basic principles. Uh, I said about the, the good and the bad readings on, uh, on a tack. That will enable you to get a feel for what is called the arc. So how much is the wind swinging through? Uh, you need to understand that because it starts to affect decisions you make then on the racetrack about how close to ley lines you want to get uh, depending on how far progressed the shift is across to one side or the other. So you need to understand what the arc is that the wind is swinging through um, and also to note if that arc increases perhaps as you get nearer to the shore and decreases as you get further away from the shore if the wind is blowing offshore. 
Uh, that, was the, that was the pattern we saw at, at, very clearly at Weymouth. Um, but uh, that's just something to watch for. And then the other key variable which you need to spot with the compasses is, is the frequency. Instead of reaching around uh, before the start, I would prefer to be running and beating so that each time we're beating, I can see you know, what's a good heading. And Sally will be taking uh, mental note of uh, what's, what are good headings and getting a feel for that. Obviously, we're looking to detect the overall pattern. I'm not going to try and do a whole thesis on tactics now. Uh, certainly refer you to some very good books. The recent Mark Russell tactics book is excellent. Um, but are you looking for an oscillating pattern? If so, how frequently? Uh, are there any persistent shifts or wind bends? But by far the most common situation is, is some sort of oscillating pattern. You can get some really good guides as to what the wind is going to do at your venue. Uh, for example, uh, Jim Saltonstall's notes uh, you can print off the web and will tell you quite a lot of useful stuff and particularly helpful for Abbasoc. Um, I didn't find them so helpful at Weymouth, um, but, but you know, they're well worth reading um, and understanding because if there are um, what they call convergent zones or divergent zones on the race course, which for example can be caused by areas of cliffs, uh, then it will give you some background information on what normally works well if one side of the beat is going to be likely to be biased. Um, uh, he's already aware of it for that venue, so it's just good as a good starting information. Okay, a bit more on the compass. I'm, I'm fairly obsessed with the compass. Um, so question, why don't I use it on tactics mode? Well, I've tried it, and the tactics mode with these things means you have to predetermine the tacking angle of the boat, and with fireflies, as I described in the light, medium, strong wind, the settings vary quite a lot on the actual sheets. So the tacking angle changes dramatically if the wind changes. Um, so gusts and lulls, the tacking angle of the boat changes. Therefore, I find the tactics idea uh, flawed because you have to predetermine your tacking angle. Um, if anyone knows different, please tell me. But I'm happy just knowing my actual, my actual angles. On the start line, I sail along the line uh, looking at the compass bearing of the other end of the line. So I'm near one end, take a sight to the other end turn the boat through 90 degrees and then look to see whether you're on port or starboard and from doing that you can tell which is the biased end of the line okay so I'll show you with the model boat you're sailing along the line you take a you take a 90 degree turn and if the boat tacks you know that that was a port bias line. If the boat's still on starboard, you know it's a starboard bias line. If it's really close, you probably know it's not worth worrying about. Okay? I'm not that interested in tide. It's not that I, um, I don't understand it, because I do, um, but I think tide dominates at estuary venues and that most sea venues, certainly the last two nationals, um, no, the last three nationals, in every race, the wind has been the dominant factor, and wind shifts and strength shifts are more important. Um, when uh, does hunting for pressure matter more than hunting for the shift? Well, uh, that's again something that's quite well documented in, in books like Mark Russell's. Um, and think about the situation where the hull um, has, your boat has not yet achieved hull speed, which is going to be in force. Uh, zero to two and a half and the boats are then varying in speed dramatically depending on whether you're in a gust or a lull so in those light wind conditions it's most important to get to the gusts first and to stay in the gusts this applies upwind and down um, as the breeze gets above that level uh, it actually doesn't matter so much. Um, the reason to get to a gust in the stronger winds is more likely to be to do with getting to the shift that is associated with the gust. But the actual increase in breeze strength won't make a, a massive difference to the speed of your boat. Okay, now I'm just going to, in conclusion, run through some...